Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Shari Shemayim. It is a privilege to be able to host this evening in which we're going to address depression and suicide in the Jewish community with some medical professionals, with social service experts, and really with our community as a whole. To be able to address this issue, to address the issue of mental health more generally, and really to address our hearts and souls. But before we do that, I have some housekeeping matters to attend to. So number one, I'd like you to turn your cell phones to vibrate or to silent if you have not already done so. I'd like to inform you that this event is being videotaped. However, even though it is being videotaped, you should be aware that uh, we've instructed uh, the videographer to focus only on our speakers and that um, the attendees and the audience will not be filmed during the course of the presentation. There will be question and answers at the conclusion of this evening that you'll be able to pose to our, panel, to our panelists. And in the interest of efficiency, uh, and also to respect the privacy of those who have questions to ask, there will be volunteers going around with cards and pens for people to write their questions uh, during the course of the presentations. In the foyer and the lobby of the synagogue outside these doors to the south, there are a number of nonprofit mental health organizations that are available and that are, are uh, positioned to distribute literature and brochures and to talk to audience members after the program about services that are available in the community. I want to thank our partners, Beth Sedek, Mount Sinai Hospital, Camp Ramah, Jewish Family and Child Services, and UJA Federation for their help in creating this event. We say in uh, Pirkei Avot, Ezehu chacham halomed mi kol adam. Who is the person who is wise? The person who learns from every person. We are here this evening to learn. We are here this evening to help and to seek help. And we are here this evening to talk. As we learn, we appreciate not only the wisdom of being able to see wisdom in every person, but we also appreciate that this sentence in the ethics of our fathers tells us something about humanity. There is no person who is empty of wisdom. Each of us, not just despite our struggles, but often because of our struggles, have something unique to teach. Each of us has an approach to wisdom, an approach to humanity, an approach to life from which we can all learn. And it's with that thought that I'd like to introduce Rabbi Baruch Freeman Cole, one of the great teachers of our city. I can speak of him as a wonderful colleague and a great pastor a person who has led a community which is sensitive to issues of mental health and really a person from, which we can, a person from whom we can learn so much. Rabbi Baruch Friedman Kohl. Thank you, you're all very generous. <laughs> Rabbi Strachler, you're very generous. Um, Rabbi Chessis. Uh, distinguished panelists and all of us honored guests. Thank you really for joining us. And I am personally grateful to Shari Shemayim, uh, to its rabbis and volunteers, to the Beth Sedek team, to Camp Ramah, to Mount Sinai, for organizing this very important, very timely event. I speak as someone who was raised by a single mother who was occasionally hospitalized for her own mental illness, and as an adult who remembers my shame and my anxiety created by the uncertainty of my mother's instability. I hope that this evening will be part of a community effort to bring mental illness, depression, and suicide out of hiding. 
so that we can help the children and parents who struggle against what often feels like overwhelming strain and pain. Tonight I want to tell you five stories. Three are from the Tanakh, the Bible. One is from the play Night Words. Um, and the last is from the Talmud. Chana. Every Rosh Hashanah we read of Chana, one of Elkanah's two wives, who was unable to bear children. And the book of Shmuel tells us that Chana wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah somehow doesn't get it. And he says to her, Chana, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Lama tivki, velama lo tochli, velama yera levavach, halo anochi tovlach measara banim. And then we are told that when Chana went to worship in Shiloh, vehim marat nefesh, vatitpalel al Hashem uvachol tivke. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Eternal and wept bitterly. A second story that you know, Yonah. Every Yom Kippur, we read of this prophet who was disturbed by God's directive to go to Nineveh and to call upon them to turn and change their ways. So Yonah, flees, sails away, and goes down, down, descending to the bottom of the boat. And those of you who know Hebrew, listen, and you'll hear a word resonate. Vayered Yafo, Vayimtsa Onia, Ba'atarshish, Vayitain Schora, Vayered Ba, Lavoimahem Tarshisha, Hashem. He went down to Yafo and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went down below to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Eternal. During the storm, the sailors jettison whatever they can to try to save the ship. And Yonah, where was he? Viona Yarad Yarkatea Svina Vaishkav Vayeradem. Yona went down into the hold of the ship, lay down, and slept. The captain of the ship calls out, he says, Wake up, get up, pray to your God. He and the sailors draw lots to determine who might be responsible for the calamity. And Yona is selected. And what does he say? Vayomer alehem, sauni vahatiluni el hayam. Pick me up, throw me into the sea. For he really doesn't believe that his life has any value. Eventually, he does go to Nineveh. He does call on the people to turn and repent. He is both successful and frustrated. He sulks on the outskirts of the city. And what does he want? Vayomer tov moti mechayai. It's better for me to die than to live. Third story, King Saul, chosen as king he actually initially hides to avoid being crowned. And whether he's shy or modest, initially Saul doesn't live like a monarch. He remains at home. He plows his own fields. And by the time David enters the picture, Saul has begun to suffer fits of depression. His advisors recommend music. And a young David comes to play the harp. After David vanquishes the Philistines, 
the giant Goliath, Goliath, after a victorious battle, Saul attempts to kill David by throwing a spear at him. And Saul develops elaborate plans to have David killed. Again and again, after attacking David, we see David flees. And even Shoal's son, Jonathan, Jonathan, recognizes there's something not right with my father. He confronts him. And Saul accuses Jonathan of being allied with David. And he throws a spear at his own son. Again, Saul goes out, Shaul goes out to hunt David. But he also sort of almost whines to his followers. All of you, you have all conspired against me. Saul alternates from this kind of murderous behavior to please, full of tears, for forgiveness. And in the end, Shaul HaMelech, the king, defeated in battle, falls onto his sword and kills himself. Now, without bringing these case histories for formal diagnosis, I simply want to note that the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, points to the terrible pain that individuals can experience. Hannah's dreams and hopes are shattered. Yonah is so anxious that he avoids responsibilities, isolates himself, and wants to die. Shaul, the king, carries such a terrible sense of inadequacy that he develops an angry suspicion of others and prefers to die rather than to face failure. We don't usually read these texts to highlight mental illness, depression, or deliberate death, but they are present. And I want to suggest that there may be a reason why we don't call attention to the pain and the sadness of these narratives, perhaps because they frighten us, make us fear the dark nights of our own souls, or remind us of the tortured times experienced by someone else we loved. Tonight, we're going to open up the subject of mental illness, depression, and suicide at a time when our country is discussing how individuals might be allowed to choose death. We're coming together, actually, to discuss how to help people choose life. A fourth story written by David Roskies, originally from Montreal, it was not written about suicide. It was composed in memory of those exterminated by the Nazis. It's from his work called Nachtwürten, or Night Words. But it applies to us. Does it matter how they died? Does it matter how they died? Kulam ahuvim, kulam berurim, Kulam Giborim. They were beloved, pure, strong, holy, and all of them opened their mouths with troubled spirits, with stumbling speech, and with no melody at all. They exclaimed in fright, O Lord of the universe, it is terrible. When we face suicide, what is really important is that those who die are no longer with us. What matters is not how they died, but that they died. A final story from the Talmud, Masechet Brachot which suggests what we might do when facing overwhelming pain or emotional trauma. Rabbi Chiyabar Abba became weak. Rabbi Yochanan went to visit him. 
And Rabbi Yochanan said to him, Chavivin alecha yisurin, yisurecha, are your sufferings welcomed by you? That is, do you believe on some level that you suffer and that you deserve to suffer? Rabbi Chia replied, neither they nor their reward. And Rabbi Yochanan said to him, give me your hand. He gave him his hand and raised him up. In the second episode, the healer, Rabbi Yochanan, is now the one who is weak and in need of healing. Rabbi Yochanan became weak. Rabbi Hanina went to visit him. And Rabbi Hanina asked, do you welcome your sufferings? And Rabbi Yochanan responds, neither they nor their reward. Rabbi Hanina said to him, give me your hand. And Rabbi Yochanan gave him his hand and Rabbi Hanina raised him. And the Talmud asks, so why couldn't Rabbi Yochanan raise himself? After all, he's a healer. Why does he need another person? And the Talmud replies that the prisoner cannot release himself from jail. In each vignette, the healing comes in two stages. First, by a recognition on the part of the person suffering that the pain is unwanted, unwarranted, undeserved. And second, from the hand of a friend that reaches out to offer support and raise up, lift up the one who is downcast, depressed, and despondent. The one in pain need not blame herself. And at the same time, we need others who recognize our trauma and care enough to reach up, reach out, and raise us up. Tonight, we're going to talk about what goes on in the mind of a person who suffers and how we as individuals and a community can break that stigma, recognize the problem, and reach out, giving our hands and our hearts to offer healing and support. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mullen Lesh. I'm the chief of psychiatry at Mount Sinai Hospital, Sinai Health System. And I'm very heartened to be here with you this evening. I'm reminded after listening to uh, the powerful remarks of uh, Rabbi Friedman Cole that uh, psychiatry has been a discipline for about 150 years, and rabbis have been a discipline for several thousand. And we understand the great wisdom that our rabbis have carried for us. The response and interest in this event is remarkable, as is the breadth of speakers you're going to hear. Uh, much credit to Sharei Shemayim, Beth Tzedek, Camp Ramah, UJA, JFNCS, and Mount Sinai Hospital for coming together uh, quite quickly, in fact, to make tonight happen. Uh, there are many to thank, but I will mention only one, and that's Jeff Lipschitz who was the driving force bringing us together. There is so much to address, and we will not do it all tonight. So best we look at this evening has a good beginning with more to follow. The format is that you'll hear a series of presentations and subsequently a panel, at which point in time we will address questions from the audience there's a basket right in the middle of the room, 
And if you have questions, please insert them there. They'll be brought up to me, and I, as moderator, will select the questions that I think give us the best diversity and best opportunity <coughs> to respond. You're going to hear from speakers who include uh, social work, clinical psychology, child psychiatry, geriatric psychiatry, and adult psychiatry, who are going to speak to you with both personal and professional perspectives. And outside, as has been mentioned, there are a number of organizations uh, who have information that may be of relevance for you. Let me set the stage by talking about what we are facing when we are addressing issues around mental illness. The costs of mental illness in Canada are huge. In addition to great personal suffering, we know that there's a one in five lifetime prevalence of mental illness. One in five people will have depression over the course of their lifetime. And if we took a snapshot of our country right now, 20% of the people who live in this great country would be suffering from some significant uh, mental illness or addiction. No family is untouched. The cost to our society is over $30 billion a year. And we lose 35 million workdays annually because of depression. It's the leading cause of disability costs. Each week, I and there are other psychiatrists in this room get at least one call requesting a referral for a friend or a colleague. Just this past week, to give you an example, I attended an event marking the celebration of a chair focused on suicide studies in honor of Arthur Summer Rotenberg, a 36-year-old physician who committed suicide. I was in a discussion group with young doctors. Four out of the nine in that group have taken a mental health leave from work over the last several years. A 70-year-old woman who completed group therapy in our hospital, while grateful for the large improvement in her depression and anxiety, lamented the fact that she didn't do this 30 years ago and could have saved herself potentially 30 years of suffering. So the bad news in this story is the prevalence. The better news is the growing awareness and effective efforts at reducing stigma and improving care. Reducing stigma is important. We can talk about things today that we couldn't even 10 years ago. Access to care is impacted by stigma, shame, and discrimination. In a poll recently, 74% of Canadians polled said that they would be reluctant to talk to their family doctor about depression. Even more so in many workplaces. Hence the key role of work and school culture and environment. It's a common story. Someone has access to EAP, employee assistance, or has insurance that pays for counseling, and are reluctant to pursue it because they're afraid if word got out in their organization, it would impact their professional trajectory. If we look at the illnesses across the spectrum, only mental illness and addiction are regularly greeted with criticism, doubting, withdrawal, rather than compassion. Stigma is a potent destructive force that wreaks its damage in several ways. It's a form of discrimination, and we know that being the object of discrimination is poor for your mental health. It produces social isolation, social connection, community support is a potent protector in the presence of mental illness. Stigma generates feelings of shame and denial. Only in mental health and illness and addiction do we regularly see the heartbreaking misalignment of the patient, the family, and the healthcare provider. Mental illness in Canada draws less funding than it should. Canada should be spending 13% of its healthcare budget on mental illness and spends instead about 7%. The lowest amongst virtually all of the rich countries in the world. 
notwithstanding the fact that we know that every dollar that's invested in care returns a fourfold increase in productivity and lower health costs, let alone the improvement in suffering and quality of life. There's an adage many of us adhere to. There is no health without mental health. Enormous impacts on our general health care because of the presence of mental illness that contributes to or exacerbates many medical illnesses. At the same time, we know that treatment helps and that attitudes that block access to treatment can be lethal. Suicide takes the lives of 15 people out of every 100,000 in this country annually and is the leading cause of death for males between the ages of 10 and 49. Suicide rates, despite all of our advances in mental illness care, have not declined in the last 40 years. Suicide is a permanent solution to what is often a temporary state and treatment can have a life-saving impact. Both patients and mental health care providers have been stigmatized. I have often received what I consider to be a backhanded compliment. You have the most normal kids of any psychiatrist I know. <laughs> Thankfully, the dialogue is changing. Last year, The Economist devoted its April 2015 issue to mental illness. Leaders in every area of life are showing great courage in speaking about their mental health concerns. The National Commission on Mental Health is a huge advance, bringing mental health and addictions out of the shadows. There's growing interest in philanthropy, and many individuals from all walks of life are willing to be identified with mental health and addiction concerns. Last week, spectacular success of Bell Let's Talk. Even Sports Illustrated regularly features an article about prominent sports icons who have required mental health care. We know that some of the best ways to reduce stigma involve what we call contact education, direct contact with individuals who are addressing mental health and addiction concerns and benefiting from treatment. And you're going to hear a compelling story shortly. We can look at an ideal approach to mental health and addiction broadly through a common public health frame that we use in many other illnesses. We think about upstream approaches, midstream approaches, and downstream approaches. Cancer is a beautiful example. And we should be inspired by the trajectory of our attitudes toward cancer and the way in which cancer care and research and advocacy has been revolutionized over the last 40 years. And we need the same for mental health. Money for treatment and research must grow because successful anti-stigma campaigns increase the numbers of people seeking care. We should not turn them away because of limited resources any more than we would turn away a patient with cancer because we didn't have the money to pay for chemotherapy. If we managed and invested in cancer care the way we do in mental health, it would be a ground-shaking scandal. Forty years ago, we declared a war on cancer. We need to do the same now with mental illness, with the same investments in research and care. It is humane, it will be effective, and it is equitable. It is only the just thing to do. I want to make a few comments about treatment and care at a kind of headline level and then we'll move on to the other speakers. What do I mean by upstream interventions? Prevention, early recognition, reducing adverse childhood experiences which we know translate into later life mental illness. We need to target resilience, helping young folks, children, uh, learn about coping strategies. We need to create healthy school environments we are learning more and more and more about the toxic and enduring effects of bullying which rob children of a sense of self-esteem and a sense of effectiveness in their own world. 
And it's not only children in school who can be bullied. People in the workplace can similarly be bullied. We need to take the pressure off our young folks. Somebody referred to this as the educational achievement arms race. Kids need to know that they can be good and decent and successful without being at the very top of everything. We need to promote psychological safety in the workplace. We know that coping strategies and training help. We need advocacy for further funding and research. Moving from upstream to midstream, we need to promote active integrative treatments that target both the mind and the body. We can do that in Canada, fortunately. In the United States, treatment is typically split between biological and psychological treatments. Uh, we are much better positioned here to integrate the bio, psycho, social. We have a range of effective biological treatments, a range of effective neuromodulation treatments, including, dare I say it, electroshock therapy which is the most effective treatment we have for severe depression, but is so badly stigmatized in the public eye that it is underutilized. We need access to psychological therapies, both face-to-face -face and on the internet. More and more evidence shows that uh, the internet can be a tremendous resource if it's used wisely and there's an opportunity for consultation about its impact. I'm very glad that at the beginning of the evening today we heard from Rabbi Friedman Cole and Rabbi, Rabbi Strachler because the spiritual dimension is also an important part of care. We need peer support, support for families, reduces isolation, helps mobilize coping, and so on. And finally, downstream, we need a commitment to provide continued care, the maintenance of care. All too often people begin to respond to a depression and then discontinue the antidepressants because they're uncomfortable with the side effects or they feel that they are out of the woods. We know that if you do not treat depression for the entire duration of its natural course, which is typically six to nine months, you're going to have a recurrence. Every recurrence increases the likelihood of another recurrence. And if you have three recurrences, then without treatment, guaranteed you're going to have a fourth. The earlier we access treatment, the better. Continue treatment to completion. Important to remember that mental health and addiction are real, and they are treatable, as you will hear more about in a moment. The kind of dialogue we are generating tonight will advance care and access, foster knowledge, education, support, and hope. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you Danielle Berman, and I'll tell you a little bit about her before I call her up.